Awesome. All right, good afternoon, everybody. And for those of you that are attending via, you know, online, it might be good evening. And uh, for you, those of you attending online, just respond via the poll. For those of you here in the room, if you could just raise your hand on which answer choice um, you feel best suits you. So how would you characterize your ability to submit an ANDA in the proper ECTD format? So just by a raise of hands, would you say that you're an expert? OK. Got a few, yeah, more than a few of those. That's great. Um, I'm pretty good at it. This is looking better. Uh, somebody else in my company handles the ECTD? There we go. This happens at every conference. I'm a beginner. All right, a few there. And then, of course, the I don't even know what ECTD is. CTD is an ICH agreed upon standard for international regulators. OK. So I'm going to cover a little bit about guidance as it relates to ECTD and study data. I'm going to talk a little bit about the metrics for what it looks like, You know, how many of these submissions are coming in in ECTD during the last fiscal year. I'll also be talking a little bit about CEDARS document room processing, how we're processing things, and actually where we could use your help. And then finally, I've got some strategies about uh, how it can help you prepare your submission to the FDA and how you can start preparing early. So rather than waiting until a month or two before you're ready to submit, some things to think about maybe a year out uh, before you submit. So guidance. So by now, everybody understands that ECTD is a requirement when you submit your ANDA as well as your NDA, BLA, or, or master file to the FDA, right? For ANDAs, that requirement went into effect back in 2017. And I'm going to show you in a couple of slides where we go over metrics that um, I'm very confident that all of you definitely realize that. Um, if a sponsor does send in something for, say, an ANDA, and it's not in ECTD format, the CEDAR document room will not accept it. You will, you'll get a fax, or you'll get an email or a phone call saying that they did not process the submission. And additionally, wanted to make sure that you know everyone is aware that in the electronic submission guidance, it does say that if you're submitting study data, into modules four or five, you need to include what's called an STF, a study tagging file. Now, the good news for all of you here is that uh, CEDAR, over the last six months or so, has been doing analysis and looking at how many of the submissions are containing that study tagging file when study data is submitted. And we find that, uh, I think, like, you know, 90 eight or 97 percent of them do. So you're doing really well on including that STF in there. And then finally, for anyone that uh, is not familiar with FDA's ECTD webpage, we have a site that has exhaustive information. It contains the, the binding guidance about ECTD, all the specifications and standards. It has information about how you could request an application number how you can um, find out about how you get a gateway account. Um, pretty much everything you, everything you need is up on that website. So we strongly encourage you uh, to check it out. And just a footnote here, uh, just in case anyone works with drug master files, uh, there was an update made to the ECTD guidance earlier this year that says that for a subset of the drug master files, these are type 3 EMFs, they have until May 5th, 2020 uh, to start submitting an ECTD. So there is another FDA guidance that's out there that is in effect, and it's for standardized study data in electronic format. 
And my colleague Ethan Chen will be speaking about this in more detail in the next presentation. But I wanted to you know, just let you know about a few things at a high level about it. And it's really important that you follow up after this meeting. Go to the FDA website. Go to this page and read about these study data requirements. Because these are in effect. These are required. And even though CEDAR hasn't been rejecting submissions for not being compliant at the door, CEDAR will start to do that in, in the future. And so now is the time to read up on it, try to understand it. If there's something you don't understand, you'll be able to contact us well ahead of time. So what is the requirement? It's that studies that start after December 17, 2016, right? those studies must be in standardized format if you're submitting that study data to the ANDA, the NDA, or the BLA. If it's a commercial IND, the date is one year uh, later for that. We have this website up here on the, on the slide. You click on that. It takes you to the FDA's website. It has the guidance. It has a technical conformance guide. Um, it has how this criteria will be enforced. There's a technical rejection criteria for study data document that the FDA has put out. It actually was put out a couple of years ago, and it was recently updated. It contains an absolute wealth of information to help you understand what exactly is CEDAR looking for when you submit that study data. And what is the determining factor on whether or not your submission passes validation or does not pass validation? And the validations that are in this technical rejection criteria for study data come from the overall document specifications for the CTB validation criteria. Where can you find the guidance about study data validation? Right here in this hyperlink. You click on it. It's also on the page. And then finally, once you go to our FDA website and you read the documents, maybe you're kind of scratching your head thinking, you know, I don't, this is kind of complex. I don't quite understand. I have some questions. Please ask us. We want you to ask us questions. And we have an email address here at the bottom called edata at fdahs.gov. So now I want to share some submission metrics. So CEDAR receives approximately 200,000 electronic submissions through the gateway each year now. Just CEDAR, not even counting for, for CBER or any of the other centers. And the great news here is that almost all of them, 192,000 out of the 200,000, were in ECTD format. So the nice thing about this chart is the blue bars are showing you the number of electronic submissions that came in through the gateway. That's the ESG, or for some of you, if you use WebTrader. And the red line shows you the percentage of those electronic submissions that were in ECTD format. So it's tremendous progress. You look at last year, like I said, I mean, almost all of them that came in through the gateway were in ECTD format, which is what we're looking for. This pays tremendous benefits to the agency. Not only are we able to process your submissions faster, but the review divisions are able to review your submissions quicker. Because the, the, uh, the submissions content is in a standardized format where we can leverage it with our tools. Breaking down these numbers a little further by application type, nearly 100% of the regulatory submissions for the ANDAs, as well as the NDAs and the BLAs, were in ECTD format, which is great. Uh, for commercial INDs and DMFs, it was 96% and 78%. Uh, and we expect that to, to go up during this next fiscal year. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about CEDAR's effort to process these electronic submissions. We are employing increased automation into our document room uh, processing. And we're able to do that because whereas before 
we would get submissions in paper, or it might be electronic, but it's not in a standardized format. Now it's all coming standardized. And so we're able to extract this information and apply uh, software to figure out where these submissions should be routed. So last year, we were still doing it the old way for the most part, meaning that the ECTD submission comes in and even though we have all this great structured data, the document room is still looking at cover letters to figure out which review division to route this to. And we get on average about 850 of these electronic submissions every day just in Cedar. Now this year, what we've been working on is applying more automation to the process. So now we have computer programs that actually, without a person being involved, reads the submission that comes in. It looks at the metadata that's in, for example, the US regional file that's one of the backbone files for the ECTD submission. It pulls out things like the application number, the submission type, submission subtype. It also pulls out things from the 356H form, right? So now that everyone is submitting their 356H form in a fillable form format, that means at the back end, our systems can automatically pull the data right out of the form. So between pulling the data out of that 356H form and pulling the data out of the US regional file, we're finding that we're able to automate more and more of the process of figuring out where submissions should go. And the benefit to you is your submission gets routed to a review office and then to the reviewer quicker. Of course, there's always challenges, right? Whenever we're trying to apply automation and software, we discover challenges along the way. So we've, we've seen two, two main challenges here. So one is we noticed that our software is reading the information out of the ECTD backbone files, and it's also reading the information out of, say, the 356H form. And every once in a while, the information it pulls from both sources conflicts. The computer doesn't know what to do. So it kicks it out of that automated process, and it goes into a queue for someone to manually look at. That slows down how fast your submission's gonna make it to the reviewer. The second piece is that the FDA reviewers who look at study data, they have these great tools at their disposal to view and analyze study data. But if you send your study data in a PDF file, these advanced tools can't do anything with it. So it's really important that you follow the study data guidance and you provide your study data in the standardized form. So I have a couple of examples for the data discrepancies that kind of interfere with this automated processing by the document room. So kind of a fun activity, can you guess the correct regulatory activity in the submission? So this first one, in the top, it's showing you the backbone file, the US regional. And in there, the sponsor coded the submission as original application, but then, on the 356H form, the sponsor checked off periodic safety report. So our automation software doesn't know which it is. It gets kicked out, it goes to the document room for a person to read a cover letter to see well, which is the intended uh, purpose. And they find out in this case, it really is a periodic safety report. So in this particular example, the sponsor should have used the submission type of other. This happens to be using one of the um, older M1 versions. They must be using software that uses the old M1, version 2.01 ETD. Uh, and that version doesn't have a periodic safety report submission type. So they should have used other. Another example is a supplement came in. And in the backbone ECTD file, the sponsor indicated CBE for the supplement effective date. 
But again, on the 356H, they indicated prior approval. It's another example where the computer software can't continue. So again, it goes to a person manually looking at the cover letter to figure it out. And in this case, it was CBE. So just in summary on the data discrepancy impact, when the data is submitted correctly and it's consistent between what's in the backbone file and what's on that 356H form, we're able to automate processing of the submission and it'll get to the review division quicker. Uh, but when uh, there's a conflict, it does get kicked out. Um, it impacts your automation capability. Um, someone has to look at the cover letter. And in some cases, the review division may need to contact to get more information. And um, if you don't know what submission type to use, contact ESA and the team will help you. So don't be, don't hesitate to contact ESA if you're just not quite sure what ECTD submission type to use. Uh, and now, finally, I'm going to talk about some tips here on preparing your electronic submission. So number one, as I mentioned earlier, we have this ECTD website. It is a wealth of information. It's got important dates about guidance. Uh, it has our ECTD submission standards, which is a whole catalog of specifications. It's got the FDA data standards catalog. It's got notices. Anything new that's going on with ECTD, any new updates to the guidance, it's all going to be up there. There's also a link at the bottom of the page if you're new, if you've never submitted ECTD before. You can click on that. It walks you through how to get an application number, how to get a gateway account. So we really encourage you to become familiar with this website if you don't already know about it. And don't wait until a month or two before you're ready to submit. This is something you want to look at when uh, you know that you're going to submit something a year out. There's also the submission hierarchy to consider. How you organize your files in the submission that you're going to send in. When you send a regulatory submission into uh, CEDAR, it should be structured following the common technical document. This is an international standard through ICH. Modules 2 through 5 are harmonized between different regulators around the world. The review divisions are going to be looking for your documents according to this hierarchy. So it's best to be very familiar with it uh, at the start of your process of putting together your documents. So one resource is called the Comprehensive Table of Contents, Headings, and Hierarchy. There's a screen capture here in the top right. It's a little bit small, but uh, what this does is it lays out very granularly where you put each type of document, whether it's a response to an information request, whether it's a cover letter, whether where you put your form, where you put your study, all this information is in here. And then there's even another layer of information available to you in an ICH document called the M4 organization of the CTD. File format and PDF specifications. FDA has this guidance out there called the Specifications for File Format Types. And it talks about the different file types, like a Word file, or maybe a JPEG, or a PDF file. In what sections of the CTD does FDA expect these different file formats? So it's great to be familiar with that. In addition, there's also the PDF specifications. This talks about whether or not you need a table of contents and hyperlinks for your PDF document. For example, if they're five pages or longer, or what the minimum font size is on your, in your PDF. So it's really important that you become familiar with this document before you start putting together your materials. I know that a lot of you contract out work, so it's important that when you work with your contractors, that they are familiar with these FDA documents. That way, they don't hand you something that's not compliant that you have to do rework on. Study data. Uh, so again, if you're submitting study data, please make sure you look at the study data for submission to CEDAR and CBER webpage. Very, very important. You want to look at it 
early. Don't wait until a month or two before you are ready to submit. You want to look at this as soon as you're starting your study. You want to start looking at this. Uh, there's some key study data resources here, the actual study data guidance. There's the technical rejection criteria for study data, which my uh, colleague Ethan Shen is going to be talking in depth about. This is a very, very important key takeaway. The study data technical conformance guide, and then the OGD site for ANDA forms and submission requirements. And then I am running out of time, so I'm just going to go through this a little bit quick. But um, when you're preparing your submission for FDA, remember you need to request your application number. You need to register for an electronics submission gateway account. And you can find out how to do that through the ECTD website. When you're ready to generate your ECTD for submission to FDA, you do that through a tool. You can publish it through an ECTD publishing tool or you use an ECTD tool vendor. The ECTD publishing tool captures that administrative information. It maps the submission content to the CTD section headings and it generates all the file structures that you need for a successful submission. You also have the option, once you've generated this, to validate it. There's some tools out there that are free that will run ECTD validation for you before you send it to FDA. You can also ask the ESUB team to look at your submission. And they'll look at it from a technical point of view to see if there's any major errors. So in summary, Important guidance requirements, right? Your submissions to your ANDA have to be an ECTD, and you need to be familiar with the technical rejection criteria for study data. It is probably the most important thing. I want you to walk away from this presentation as well as my colleague Ethan Chen, who's up, who's up next. Your submission could be rejected if you don't follow what this technical rejection criteria for study data says. It won't be rejected tomorrow, but there are plans or later in the year where that, that can be the case. So we want you to look at it. We want you to come to us with questions. Uh, we ask that you please make sure that your metadata in your backbone files for ECTD is consistent with what you put on your regulatory form, like the 356H. And of course, when you're getting ready to prepare to submit, we want you to be familiar with what the resources are on our website. And you have your content aligned with CT. So with that, thank you very much. I appreciate you sticking around here for us. I know we're one of the latest uh, presentations. And for those of you on